What's up, advocates? I got a question for you. Did we forget why we were here? And here's why I asked this question. I've been very fortunate with the Leading Equity Center to do training with a lot of professional staff, teachers, school leaders, counselors, social workers, entire districts. And over the past few years, one of the things that I have recognized is just because we provide professional development training for our faculty and staff does not mean that our students' experiences will change. I'll say that one more time. Just because we provide professional development for our faculty and staff does not mean, does not guarantee that our students' experiences will change. So it goes back to my original question. Did we forget why we were here? In today's video, I'm going to share why student empowerment is essential in our schools. When I was a young child, I'll be honest, <laughs> I was not the nicest kid. I wouldn't consider myself a bully. However, I definitely like to tease. Now, if you follow me, you know I like to make jokes and I used to like to make jokes as a kid. But when you start to tease others, one of the things that you recognize is you never tease other students in front of the teacher. Kids are smart enough to know that. High schoolers, middle schoolers are smart enough to know that. So as adults, as educators, we're working hard to be culturally responsive and, and we're doing this equity work at our level, which is excellent. And I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But I don't want us to forget that when we are not around, when we have stepped out of the classroom, when we aren't in the hallways, when we're not sitting at the lunchroom table, things may happen. Things like racism and bullying can happen. Imagine a child, a student, a, a middle schooler who is not part of the dominant culture. They represent a small percentage within the larger scheme of the school. Not only that, but they are a student who does not have any adults who represent any of the identities that they represent. Now imagine their experiences throughout the school day when microaggressions occur, when prejudice and discriminations happen. Perhaps when they're raising their hand and they don't seem to be recognized. A student may start to feel as if they are invisible. Maybe they have had an experience where a student has come up to them and has said something to them that was very hurtful. And they went to their teacher and told the teacher what happened. And the teacher brushed them off and said, oh, Billy was just playing, lighten up. Let's say you have a Latinx student who has been told, when are you going back to Mexico? And let's say this student wasn't even Mexican. They're Guatemalan. Or you have an Asian student who's being teased or bullied and told, well, why did you bring COVID here? This is all your fault, your people's fault. Why do y'all eat dogs and cats and bats, all these weird animals? Why do you eat that? It's all your fault. You brought COVID here. How does a student who experiences these types of blatant acts, and again, often not in an adult's presence, how do they respond to this? How do we empower our students and provide them with the language to advocate for themselves? Every video, we talk about being an advocate because we recognize that we do not live in a just society. We remember those things. We have young children, 13 years old, 15 years old, 12, 10 years old, who have these experiences every day, and they just need the language. They just need to know, how do I respond? What do I say when I need help? and there's no one else around. It's just me and I'm experiencing these things. How do I respond? Last year, right after the murder of George Floyd, I had a superintendent reach out to me and she had the same question. She said, Sheldon, you've been working with our district for this past year and we appreciate the work that you're doing. But in the middle of the pandemic, in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests and civil unrest due to the murder of George Floyd, we have students, and, and we don't have a lot of black students, but we have students within our schools that need help. They've expressed to us that they do not feel as if their voice is being heard. Sheldon, could you talk to our kids? 
I said, yes, let's do this. Because I felt that it was essential for us to get to the root of things. I met with this group of high school students and they were representatives of multiple high schools within the district. And we came together for 90 minutes. I structured some implicit bias work. We engaged in some breakout rooms. We talked about how they felt as a result of the pandemic coupled with George Floyd. Now, this wasn't just a group of black students. This was a mixture of students from all races. One of the things that some of the white students said was, I recognize police brutality is wrong. I don't know what to say. How do I support my peers? I'm not black. I don't know what to say or do, but I, I want to stand in solidarity. I just don't know how. We unpacked all of this within 90 minutes. And I felt that it was so beneficial. The superintendent and the staff present in the session felt that there was much more work to be done because they discovered that although as adults, we sometimes believe that we know how our students are experiencing school every day. We understand how they are feeling, but it brought out a lot of stuff. Some of the things that the students talked about was how they felt like they'd been racially profiled in the hallways. These conversations were very important and pivotal with creating more work to be done. I had students say that they felt that the school was literally just trying to get them out of COVID and finish the school year, that they didn't care about their lives. Their lives didn't matter beyond getting them done with school. How do we figure out grades? What do we do for assessments? That seemed to be the focus. And that was the message the students got. This past school year, we expanded upon this program and what we did was we created a student affinity group. Now, around the same time, when I was working with this group of students in North Carolina, I had another principal reach out to me for her school. They had a social justice club, and so their advisor and I worked together, and we said, let's do this work as well. And so we also created these sessions. So let's talk about it for a second. Why is creating social justice affinity groups essential? Well, this goes back to my original example regarding our students who are not part of the dominant culture. They represent a small identity. Maybe it's racial. Perhaps it's cultural. Maybe it's ethnicity. Having confidence in one's identity is not always easy when your identity is not part of the dominant group's demographics. Navigating a space where school staff and students do not validate students' lived experiences and needs may invoke silence and feelings of oppression. The bottom line is students need to occupy spaces in which they can be themselves. Now, what is a social justice affinity group? A social justice affinity group is a group of students who share exclusion and isolation experienced due to their identity. Social justice affinity groups also include members willing to utilize their privilege and solidarity with members outside of the dominant school culture. Now, we have to keep in mind that these affinity groups are not just for those who identify with these historically marginalized identities. We also need others who are willing to utilize their privilege, who recognize that they have privilege and are willing to stand in solidarity with them as well. So over this past school year, we have learned to work with middle schoolers, we work with high schoolers, and we have created these social justice affinity spaces. One of the things that we have discovered is a safe space is not enough. Putting a rainbow on the door, saying I'm a safe haven, saying that I am an ally was just not enough. The students needed more than that. Our students wanted to learn the terminology. What is a microaggression? What are examples? of a microaggression or a micro insult, micro invalidation, micro assaults. What are those? What is implicit bias? What is privilege? Do I have privilege? Could you break down race for me? I need support with gender pronouns and my identity within the LGBTQ plus community. How do I respond in situations that impact me negatively? They wanted to learn the terminology so that they could articulate their responses in a way that made them feel empowered. Think about those times when you were a student, or maybe you can relate to being the only person or part of a smaller population in a larger space of students and experiences you might have had as a student with microaggressions, bias, and privilege. 
Wouldn't it have been nice if you had received training or, or maybe you did? Perhaps you had someone supportive of you that helped you navigate your school day and provided you with a lot of the terminology and language and ways to respond in situations. But if you didn't have that, wouldn't it have been nice to have been able to be coached, to receive some training, and feel empowered as a student? The next thing that the students told us is that they wanted real scenarios. What do I say? How do I respond? Break this down to me. My classmate just told me, you look good for a dark-skinned girl. What do I say to that? So we provided them with real-life experiences, scenarios, and we said, okay, here's the scenario. This is what happened. How would you respond? And we would unpack that. We created breakout rooms for our students to be able to engage with one another in smaller settings. And then we gave them opportunities to do some work. This wasn't a set of venting sessions. There was some action behind this. We helped our students create a plan that they could present to their administration some of the challenges at their school. And we taught them how to advocate for change. See, the Leading Equity Center is all about advocacy. Now, have you thought about creating a student affinity group at your school, at your district? Are you looking at ways to get it started? Maybe you're an individual who wants to get this work done, but you just don't know where to get started. You're toying with the idea. You know that the parents have asked for it. Maybe the students have asked for it. And you just need help getting it off the ground. We can help. We created 10 workshops that will take your students through a progression, starting with implicit bias and self-awareness and ending with empowerment and advocacy. This is not just for your students of color. This is for your students who are supportive, again, who recognize that we do not live in a just society. If you wanna learn more, if you want to set up this program at your school, it's called the Advocacy Room, an affinity space for student voices. There's a link in the description down below with more information. Creating a safe space for students or putting up an ally sign above the classroom door is no longer enough to accommodate our students who have historically been marginalized. Many of the students in our schools have experienced microaggressions, discrimination, prejudice, and stereotypes from their peers and even their school staff. We cannot forget why we are here, and we have to recognize the importance of student empowerment. Are you ready to transform the culture inside your school or your district? We're here for the kids, and we all have to recognize the importance of student empowerment. Let's continue to be a voice in leading equity.